experts. In uh, and um, I'll, I'll go ahead to my right here. So, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am uh, Major Dr. David Oxil, representing uh, EDF. I'm from the commanding office of Naka Sangha and Thank you very much. Thank you, and welcome, David. Uh, my last name is John Solutinia Kavokoza, and I'm an orthopedic officer and uh, I head the Twitter School of Orthopedic Medicine in Malabu. And uh, across the table here, our uh, resident uh, emergency physician expert. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Kenneth uh, D. Bagonza. I'm an emergency physician uh, and I also teach at uh, Bar University of Science and Technology. Great. So, again, um, welcome everyone. And I would just uh, encourage people if you have questions uh, to put them in the chat, is probably the best way, or you can use the QA. So, so, at this point, um, we're going to uh, turn it over to uh, have the pretest and hear about people's uh, expectations for today. And the pretest. Um, okay. um, for any people on the phone, uh, I know on Zoom, who would like to share what their expectations are for today's session, please raise your hand and the pretest should be up. Would anybody like to share their expectations for today's sessions? I think that um, if everyone's looking at the picture here, you can see that we have an interesting session ahead of us. Uh, we're going to hear about both blast injuries, but also um, from our local experts about uh, how we do some splinting in orthopedic treatment. Somebody's trying to talk, you can go ahead and um, take yourself off mute. If you want to share expectations or you could place them uh, in the chat. Yes, I can talk. Yes, please do. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, my, yeah, my name is Insuga Yakobo from Guru University a fifth year medical student. I'm just glad to be here. I'm happy to learn a lot in what, really, what it really it takes when you have a blast, massive accident within a situation like that happened previously in Uganda. I'd love to know and I'm eager to know the steps taken, the immediate steps taken, what you do, how you do, talk to the people around and other things. Thank you so much. For this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Another one in the chat says that uh, would like to know about the different mechanisms and approaches to blast trauma. And Annette um, uh, says that she would like to gain knowledge about blast trauma and how to manage it as the nurse. Thank you. And again, reminder that the pretest is up and please fill out the pretest and share any expectations uh, in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, one of the participants said he, they want to know about the long-term complications of blast trauma patients. 
to understand the specific management and to learn how we can easily um, um, help individuals who have had blast or massive trauma. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Businga Patrick Massa from Mugulu University. I'd like to know more about the clarification of uh, open femoral injury uh, fractures. Thank you. There's some uh, expectations of um, pre-hospital approach to mass casualties and blast injuries. Te techniques to manage uh, blast trauma without equipment or tools, mechanism of injuries, and then um, the do's and don'ts about managing the patient. Thank you all. Okay. So I think we're ready to move on. Um, uh, so at this point, I'd like to uh, turn Turn to um, Dr. Andrew Aliket, uh, the medical officer from Kumi Orthopedic Center. Are you on the line and can you unmute yourself? Yes, thank you very much. Global for this opportunity. And you have the case presentation. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, everybody. I'm called Dr. Elokate Andrew. I'm a uh, medical officer at Kumi Orthopedic Center. Okay. Yes, I'm a medical officer at Kumi Orthopedic Center, uh, and I'm going to presenting a case for today. Yes, so the case is of a 19-year-old boy, DO, a 19-year-old boy, a referral from a patch hospital presented with a three-day history of acute sharp piercing pain localized to the left distal thigh with associated swelling and failure to bear weight following a gunshot. That was on 26th of Feb, January 2023. It was preceded by a scuffle with robbers who raided their house in the night. Uh, reports bleeding profusely from the wounds with on and off dizziness. Also reports receiving IM diclofenac prior to the time of referral. Okay. So case management according to ATLS protocol. Uh, first of all, what was striking our attention was circulation and hemorrhage. The patient came with dressing that was soiled with blood. There was mild bleeding from the wounds and classified as a gasilo type 3A. Uh, there was moderate pallor. Uh, pulse rate was that high, 132 over that. Uh, BP was that. Um, cup refill was greater than 30 seconds. To be specific, it was five seconds. Um, what interventions do we take for that, uh, for that bachelor? Parameter. We reduced the fracture and split with the Thomas split. I guess most of us know what how a Thomas split looks like. Uh, we also applied pressure dressing. We went ahead with a team that was available, including the three nurses on duty that day. We put large ball cannulas, uh, size 18. Um, we grouped and cross matched and transfused them with two liters of whole blood. On the airway, uh, and cyst spine mobilization. Patient was able to talk to us and had no secretions, neither did he have cervical tenderness. Much as there was a bit of scaffold, maybe we expected some injuries also could have happened, but uh, he was okay, he was okay on arrival. On breathing and uh, ventilation, we removed this shirt and the uh, chest was symmetrical, moving the respiration, no obvious respiratory distress. Um, chest is clear with equal airway, equal with the, uh, with was equal with bilateral air entry. Uh, no chest tenderness on palpation. 
Respiratory rate was that 25 breath per minute and SPO2 in room air was that. So we maintain the patient in room air. Yes, on disability, patient is, was conscious and well-oriented, scoring that GCS of 15 out of 15. Pupils equal and active, uh, reactive to light. Sensation uh, was grossly normal due to the injury site. Uh, RBS on arrival was that 7.2 millimoles. We maintained a splint in situ according to that parameter. Exposure wise, uh, there was no obvious laceration or bruises that the patient presented with. And also we gave him injection of Dynapa as we were manipulating uh, the, the fractured limb. Yes, next. Uh, according to the secondary survey, after, after, after the other primary survey, we usually take this mnemonic examples, um, which S stands for signs and symptoms. Um, of course, the patient presented open wounds, the swelling on the limb, there was pallor with cold extremities. On the A, the patient didn't have any allergies recorded. Medications prior to referral, we received IM diclofenac. Uh, past medical history is zero negative, according to the history. The last meals, the patient had had a meal 12 hours ago prior to arrival to hospital. On the events, the patient was shot on the thigh by robbers as they tried to stop, as he tried to stop them from entering their father's room because they wanted to access the money since the father was a dealer with mobile money and the agent banking. So remarkably, uh, uh, blast injuries or gunshot injuries, the patient clinically presented with anemia. There was shock because we saw previously how the pulse rate was, was very high. Uh, we also saw that he had open wounds from the history and uh, our examination findings. Also, as we tried to mobilize him, of course, you know, once a gunshot wound penetrates a tissue, it most likely leaves a fracture to the limb. So without even doing imaging clinically, the patient seemed to be having a fracture of the femur. You go to our next slide. Um, just go to the other slides. Where is management? We shall come and look at that later. Yes. The management principles usually we consider for open fractures because an open fracture is basically communication between bone and external environment. Once there's penetration of bone, we consider that an open, open fracture. And open fractures have principles of management. According to the principles of management, according to AO, we usually consider about five principles in the management of open fractures. The first one is preserving life. The other is pre preventing infection. Uh, the other is debridement. Uh, fracture mobilization and soft tissue care as we shall continue looking down. As you can see, you, let's check the slide of, uh, go to the slide of the wound. Yes, as you can see that there was an entry wound there and the exit wound was on the other medial aspect of the thigh. That was almost at the knee joint. You know, fracture that deal with the knee joint are usually very tricky to handle. You move to the next slide, shall continue going on and off the slides. Next slide. You go to the management that you had a word. Yes, uh, yes. So as we kept the patient on our unit, we obtained X-rays of the left femur, AP and lateral, so that it can provide for us a fracture pattern clearly. Uh, these X-rays, I wasn't able to get them, but they showed clear that there was uh, a fracture at the distal femur almost at the joint in the supraconder area of the femur. This fracture shattered the bone and was very difficult to mobilize those bones during uh, surgery. Pre and post uh, transfusion HBs, on arrival, he had 9.3. And uh, after transfusing the two units, the other day we checked the HB, it was 10.1. Significantly, we had tried to achieve that. Uh, we also went ahead to give IM tetanus toxoid that's 0 0.5 mils start. As you know, usually where you have uh, fractures, we, we consider giving IM tetanus toxoid, as the experts maybe will digest later. Uh, while on ward as well, we gave uh, antibiotics, IV, cefazolin, and gentamicin, but with these antibiotics, usually we have to be careful with the dosing. You remember the patient had stayed in another facility for three days without getting treatment. 
So we don't know possibly, we didn't, we didn't see how, uh, we didn't get a history of how a patient was managed there fully because they didn't provide a referral note. Uh, I mean, they didn't provide details on the referral note. But while on ward, we gave cefazolin and, and gentamicin 80 milligrams BD for, for five days. And then cefazolin had given one gram eight hourly. Uh, also, we, while on ward, we went ahead to do, after stabilizing the patient, we went ahead to do what we call a first stage muscular. A first stage muscular involves those things that we have listed there, debridement, uh, irrigation, antibiotic cement spacer. What's very key in a first stage muscular, for those maybe who have not heard about it before, a muscular is a technique that's used to manage bone defects, and uh, we have, uh, in cases where we suspect infection. Of course, with gunshot wounds, it leaves a lot of injury to the bone. Remember, a gunshot moves a, a lot of energy. So it leaves destruction to tissues, uh, soft tissues, and then bone itself. So a first stage muscular is the preferred technique that we use, muscular techniques, uh, preferred techniques we use for managing such, such injuries. So for this case, while in theater, we do serial debridement of the tissue around the entry site, and then the exit site of the bullet, and then also irrigation. We lavage with a lot and a lot of water. We started with tap run, I mean, uh, tap water and then later on normal saline. A lot of theories or conspiracies come around those uh, agents that we use for, 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 for irrigation. Some prefer using tap water, some say we use iodine, some say we use normal saline, but we went ahead to use tap water and then later on normal saline for irrigation. Of course, there's an adage which goes that pollution, I mean, uh, dilution is a solution to pollution. So once, we, once you dilute, I mean, a certain maybe content, you I mean, once you dilute, you're able to solve the problem of pollution. For, for this case, what we're fighting hard is the organism that causes infection in the wound. So we had to leverage with a lot of uh, normal saline and uh, running, the tap running water. Also, uh, the antibiotic that we use here is, for those who have not seen it before, uh, I, I need to come with one in the office here. But usually it's like a powder that you mix with the uh, gentamicin. You mix very slowly for, for cases or, or, or in first stage muscular, we use, we mix because we want to get something that's firm that's able to hold the bone in place. Remember there was a lot of debris that had been lost. So for this case, we provide a cement spacer, which is hard enough to maintain an alignment of the bone. So in these cases, you mix it so fast so that it can be able to harden and achieve length of the, of the femur. Uh, and also in the first stage muscular, in the first operation, we're able to put an external fixator because in these cases, you're trying to, you, 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 it's already having it in your mind that the patient is going to develop infection. So we first went ahead to put an external fixator to prevent, uh, since we're aware that there's going to be infection, to prevent the uh, uh, infection rates. Uh, the patient stayed with external fixator and this first stage muscular was up for about, for about six weeks before taking back for the second surgery. Uh, you, uh, Thomas, you can first check in my first uh, uh, illustrations of the pictures behind. Go behind again. Behind. Okay. Before, before you 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 see that image there is a post op image, but that was done in second stage muscular. I'll explain further. There is a bone defect that was between between uh, uh, okay the supracondyles of the femur and the and the shaft of the femur. You can see that at that point, we lost some bone in that area. So that's a space where we put bone cement, okay? Because we want, we want the, uh, the, the bone cement to give you some length. I don't know if you're able to appreciate that. The images are not quite clear, but uh, you can significantly notice that there's some defects of bone in that area. That's why you put the bone cement to achieve alignment of the bone. In the next slides, back to the uh, management. in front, yes. So in the second stage muscle, usually we, it involves putting steel antibiotics, antibiotic cement, which we call a PMMA, before you reach there. Back slide, uh, yes. In the second stage muscle, which was done six weeks later, it involves still the same antibiotic spacer, but uh, in, this, in this scenario, you mix it very slowly because we want really that uh, cement spacer to release some antibiotics that are able to control infection in that wound, okay? So in these cases, you mix the cement very slowly 
so that you can uh, make small bits. You tie around maybe nylon, don't tie around in your bike because you know bike will be composed. You tie around nylon, and then you pack in the in the in, in the bond effects. I mean, in the in the dead space. Uh, this 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 cement space. In this case, you make it in form of bits. You tie them around nylon, then you pack them there. It's not like the first case, the first stage muscle where you form a long component that you push inside the bone canal. So second stage muscle was done. And uh, in this stage, we were able to put a plate with screws that are that help to buttress the fracture. You saw it in the other post-op X-ray. Uh, the PMM bits means for means uh, polymethyl metacrylate uh, bits. But while on ward, because uh, the patient stayed for about uh, three months, while on, two months, while on ward, uh, since there was a delay of referral of a patient, it was very hard to manage these open fractures. Because then while when we took the patient in theater, still there was a lot of complications still with the organism. So we had first take uh, culture and sensitivity. You saw the Thomas first go to the other pictures behind for the images of the post-op. Yes, you can see that image clearly. Yes, that very one. You can see that around the, the metal you're seeing there, that's a buttress plate. There was a bit of kind of dead tissue there and uh, like pass, pass around the plate. So that complicated so much while the patient was on ward. Remember this patient stayed three days without getting any treatment. The patient was the only got IV gentama, I mean, IV dynapa. So it was a bit hard to, to control infection in this patient and the patient ended up complicating. So it was a bit difficult to handle this case. We had to take culture and sensitivity for, to get the sensitive organisms. Uh, Significantly, we were able to get a gram positive foci that was sensitive to, um, it was PISA, meropenem, and mepenem in that order. So we put them on those antibiotics for 14 days. Yes, there was a bit of improvement, pass reduced. We removed the plate there and put back the patient to external fixator. That's how the patient was able to fail on ward. But of course, these are very expensive procedures and they require a long stay on ward. It became so difficult for the patient and they requested for a referral to POSU. So as you can appreciate that, usually first aid is very important in handling a patient. Your initial steps in handling a patient are very key in uh, fracture management. Mm -hmm. Because the patient mm -hmm. said for three days, the patient said for three days, no antibiotics, no debridement was done. So at that rate, mm -hmm. increase the levels of infection, yeah, increase the chance of the patient getting infected. So that, that wasn't a surprising thing for this patient because what you expect really for a person who knows something that when a patient stays for long, when it's an open fracture and stays for long without getting treatment, is able to complicate, is, is, is at the risk of complicating. So a patient ended up complicating and still required more funds for surgery to stay on board. Okay. Um, the other principle that I didn't clarify so much was the, about soft tissue care among the five principles of fracture management. Soft tissue care, Thomas, if I go to the previous image of the wound. Okay, that image particularly is the, it was an intra op picture where you see that crocodile forceps crossing there with the glove held is a, a cement space that was placed there. Okay, that was intra op. You see that cement was able to expire that space which was there that was left by a broken bone. Eh? Thomas, go to the other picture. I um, think among the very last. Yes, that one. You see how that wound uh, was a bit gaping. So all that space that you see there, that, uh, that, that I think that's a rectus tumoris, those who know anatomy there, we're able to, we, we're supposed to do their bone grafting after infection being controlled, but since the patient was referred before we were able to achieve that, we referred him with that wound there like that, with an external fixator, but ideally that wound was supposed to be grafted. All that area there is still grafted in the second stage muscle after resting infection, okay? Um, Basically, I think that's the case that we had. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Maybe questions will come in later, but uh, briefly, that's the case that we had. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Elokit uh, Andrew. Uh, and I think we want to open it up to people in the audience for any comments uh, or uh, reactions or questions for Dr. About Ronald, Ronald Komata, you can go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
for the presentation. It was quite a wonderful case, and I think that the team really did a great job in managing the patient. Uh, in the presentation, I noticed uh, the choice of antibiotics in the, the intravenous antibiotics. I saw cefazolin and, uh, and gentamicin. So my, my concern is to do with gentamicin. Uh, during the presentation of the case, uh, the presenter mentioned that the patient was in shock. And we know very well that uh, <clears throat> patients in shock, acute kidney injury, and yet gentamicin is nephrotoxic. So uh, my, my concern was to do with why the choice of gentamicin in a patient who possibly has... Thank you very much. I can go ahead to reply your question. Yeah, well, as you know, with uh, when there's delay for referral of a patient, you expose the patient at risk of a kidney injury. But for this particular case, we usually weigh risk against benefit, okay? There was a risk of uh, a kidney injury in this patient. We, we assessed and the risk was minimal, but the risk of infection in the patient was higher than the risk of a kidney injury. So we went ahead to give gentle medicine at a minimal dose. That's why I realized I was telling you we we're giving 80 milligrams in a divided dose, okay? I don't know whether I've answered you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Lukat. Any other questions or comments about this uh, very challenging case? Hello, can I had uh, something on that presentation? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Tim and uh, Team Echo and uh, MOH for organizing Echo. Uh, there's something I, I want to put to a notice. Uh, from maybe the military background, I'm uh, I'm working with the UPDF and I'm a commissioned officer. So in our uh, blast injuries or gunshots, it uh, sometimes depends on what type of uh bullet has been used when in combat. Uh, some of the bullets can leave fragments when uh, they are shot at anyone or an object. So I think it's paramount that whoever receives somebody with a gunshot wound, when you're dealing with such injuries, uh, you really have to do gross debridement and surgical toileting to make sure that if there are any fragments, you expel them because the more of them that stay in somebody's body, the more you will have sepsis every now and then. And then uh, my second concern is about the three days that the patient stayed without treatment. I think it calls that back to the multidisciplinary approach when we're dealing with, uh, with different cases. Let them not be surgical. So team-based team care, I think, is the way we need to go. You realize that as of now, we've not yet as a country had a, a standard approach to <coughs> care delivery. So we don't know, everyone comes, they do their thing and the other part of the team doesn't know what to do next. So, and the doctor that has presented has talked more about those three days that a patient stayed without treatment. So we need to appreciate what could have gone wrong to make to see that a patient stays on a unit three days and they're not receiving treatment. Thank you. So, thank you very much. Um, there's another comment from Catherine Isa. You can unmute. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, from the presentation, I don't know what degree of shock the the patient was in because I noticed. Uh, I think that BP was one zero something over, but specifically had a tachycardia. So I needed to know at what level did they manage the shock and how did they manage the shock? Was it pre-op, intra-op? Um, I don't know how much units of that was given in the patient. And then I also noticed uh, the acronym of sample. Because I think signs and symptoms come in in primary survey, and that's why we have the admiss or missed. So you can comment on that. Thank you. 
Thank you. So um, I don't know, Dr. Um, Eilekhet I wants to answer that about the shock, but I think after this answer, we'll go ahead and move on to our next expert. Thank you. You're on mute. You're on mute, Dr. Eilekhet. Uh, I didn't get clearly the question on the on the samples, that last question that you asked. Uh, well, think... But the grading, of... sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, but uh, classically, this patient presented with a, a hemorrhagic shock. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, theoretically, we classify shocks in different ways, but uh, clinically, the patient presented with a hemorrhagic shock because remember, as I told you, previously from history that the patient was in a pool of blood prior to referral here because the injury happened at home, you remember, they went to a health, uh, health general hospital when they had already bled. And uh, while in the general hospital, I think they just applied a light dressing because it came when the dressing was really soiled for three days when in the general hospital. So clinically, the patient was having a hemorrhagic stroke. But uh, when you go to theory where they classify the strokes into class A, class B, depending on the BPs and then amount of blood lost, we are unable to quantify that, okay? I don't know whether I've answered you, but you could maybe repeat yourself on the S that you asked before. I, thank you, Dr. Elkin. I think we uh, need to move on in the interest of time, but thank you. Uh, at this point, I think we have uh, uh, one of our experts, uh, Major Dr. Odin David, um, who's really from the Uganda People's Defense Forces, and I think he's an expert um, and will help us uh, understand whether it be blast injuries or gunshot wounds. Dr. Um, thank you very much, our dear listeners and uh, panelists here. Um, first of all, I'd like to start by giving a few definitions. A blast, a blast is to damage or to destroy something or to injure or kill someone using a gun or bomb. Um, explosion is a violent shattering or blowing apart of something as, in, as caused by a, a bomb. Explosive. <clears throat> explosive, these are chemicals or compounds which when combined uh, tend to react to and burst into frames or react to form unstable compounds. I am sure you've heard of uh, an acronym IED, which is an improvised explosive device. This is a, an unconventional explosive weapon that can take any form or be activated in a variety of ways. Here are the most common things we are going to get in this era of uh, uh, terrorism we have so far. Uh, briefly, um, in a blast injury, we are looking at, or in a blast uh, situation, we are looking at uh, the, bigger, the bigger picture is in a mass casualty events or incidents involving explosions. There are three concentric zones that identify. First is the blast epicenter where the explosion has taken place. The secondary blast perimeter, you have the blast periphery. Explain the blast epicenter, which is the kill zone. Most people are dead or they are mortally injured during the explosion. The secondary perimeter, you have the critical casualty zone. More survivors with multiple injuries. Then you have the blast periphery. Here you have the walking wounded zone. May or most may have non-life threatening injuries with the psychological trauma. First of all, let's, let us appreciate what are these possible causes of blasts or explosions. Can start with a domestic fire at home. It can be an act of war. It can be terror. It can be accidents, which can be an aviation a plane crash. You can have industrial, uh, light fuel leaks and explosions, chemicals from factories uh, leaking and exploding, uh, nuclear, electrical, uh, structural failure. The building can collapse and sets a chain of. Uh, of events which may result into blasts, sabotage, um, military, you can have um, military stores exploding where they store explosives, things can uh, explode due to their unstable nature, or you can have what they call an exploded ordinance. 
Maybe during war, the bomb was forgotten somewhere in a building, and after some time, it becomes unstable and explodes, and then you have um, an incident. So when an explosion occurs, it creates a blast wave. This an intense blast wave will cause tissue tear of varying degrees, depending on its intensity, to the eardrums, lungs, abdomen. Blast waves also throw debris at very high speed, which can injure parts of the body. With that, we appreciate, we now start appreciating what will occur when a blast takes place. So um, the, 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 the main classifications of uh, blast injury, which will be alluded upon with by my colleague, we have the four basic mechanisms of the blast injury. First of all, we have the primary, which is caused by the blast, over pressure the blast wave. You have the secondary caused by the flying debris, uh, sharpness. You have the tertiary actually caused by the wind. As the pressure waves go, you find people are thrown out or thrown against uh, an object. Then you have the quaternary. These are the caused by the vectors. It can be either due to the heat or other and or other incidents which which which, which occur following the blast. Maybe it can exhibit other ongoing illnesses or uh, conditions we have. Um, the main issue that I want to talk about is the scene management. When you as a health worker, you are informed of major incidents, there are two scenarios you are going to react in. One, I need to be that to expect casualties in hospital, or you are being called to go to the ground zero where the explosion has taken place. When you receive the initial call, the key questions you must ask yourself. Who has called? Identify the caller. Why has he called? Find out what is the nature of the incident they want to respond to. Is it a suspected bomb blast? Is it a chemical accident? Is it a building that has collapsed? All of these will form how you are going to respond as you go towards the, the incident. Who is involved? What is the number of casualties you expect there? The next question is, you will need to get an all clear from the security teams on the ground. And these first responders normally include teams like fire and rescue. You have the police and the police, you have the crime scene uh, team. You have the anti-terror team. You also have the military, who can also have the crime scene, the anti-terror team. Then also you have the hazmat team, hazardous material team, those who, who deal with uh, chemical spills of any nature that may occur. You also have the civilians who could have come in there. For example, you have the Red Red Cross, you may have the St. John Ambulance, you may also have uh, responders from the hospitals who are nearby who may could have sent in their um, personnel. You as the first responder on the ground, you need first of all, what is your purpose there? Your purpose there, one, is to preserve and maintain the life that includes yours. Do not move where the ground is unstable. Two, you need to protect yourself, depending on the scenario. If it is a chemical spill, you have the right PPE to handle that patient. Three, how you are going to communicate. You who are seeing the victim on the ground, you need to pass information backwards to the hospital. Describe what you see, what is required, such that the team who are giving you definitive care are ready to handle this casualty as you come along. Um, why is information or communication important? We need to have clear and effective information so that we prepare and have the appropriate human resource and the appropriate equipment. Remember that all equipment we have in hospital and the human resource is actually quite scarce. Two, you also need to prepare yourselves just in case the the number of casualties that are coming in 
overwhelm your hospital and end up with a muscular dystrophy situation. You need to plan. Do you have the side capacity? You may need to occupy other wards that are within. You may need to call for additional personnel. You may need to inform other peripheral hospitals around so that they can handle other patients who are coming in. You agree that you're going to handle all those who are red, and other hospitals will handle maybe the yellow and the green. Three, you also need to manage how your ambulances are going to come in. So you need to have almost like a medical incident commander who would be, whose duty would be to channel your rescue efforts such that you don't have a breakdown in um, how you're going to manage your limited resources in the view of the commotion and the chaos that is uh, taking place there. Three, you need to prepare yourself for handover. You are not going to be there forever, so you need to have a mechanism of relief, otherwise you may burn out uh, in the field. Last but not least, what we always forget is documentation. Document, document. The purpose is, one, to track the casualties, two, evidence uh, preservation. Thank you very much. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Odom David, for sharing that wisdom, your wisdom with us in the common sense about having a safe scene, about having your adequate resources, the importance of communications, uh, and, uh, and some kind of incident command at the scene. And finally, to document all that you have done so you could appropriately hand over your patients to those taking over. We will have questions and answers at the end of the presentations by our experts. And so at, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn, uh, uh, turn it over to Dr. Bagonza Kenneth to talk a little bit about um, triage, assessment, and management of blast injury patients from the emergency medicine perspective. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hari and uh, Dr. Tim for that uh, very interesting introduction, as well as Dr. Ilokit. Uh, they have made uh, my, my, my work quite simple. And really, uh, I'll be looking at how do we triage, and we'll have a small chat, because I know um, uh, these eco sessions in the past have covered triage. Uh, so we'll just uh, touch base on a few things in, in pre-hospital triage, in hospital triage, and then um, and then uh, how do we manage these cases? And really what I'm going to talk about is, um, I'm just going to re-emphasize the importance of uh, uh, scene safety, and this is both safety in the field where the incident has occurred, but also safety within hospitals. And uh, um, Dr. Tim has done a very good job talking about um, uh, the different kinds of uh, institutions or organizations that you'll expect to respond. And uh, these organizations have different capacities and uh, some are more equipped than others. So if there's a team that's, uh, if, if, if this is a suspected act of terrorism, and we have anti-terrorism teams on the ground, we have military teams on the ground, then it, it is primarily their role to be able to uh, clear the scenario, make it safe for civilian responders uh, to be able to uh, move in and then do what they have to do. So uh, as civilian responders, uh, health workers, I mean, uh, when you get there, then obviously uh, you do not take your safety entirely into your own hands. You have to be guided on where you can and cannot go. And uh, even if there's a patient who's actively dying, but that particular scenario has not been, or that scene has not been secured, then you cannot go to that scene. Because uh, ultimately you all know that in an emergency response, uh, first and foremost, your safety is paramount. Because if you, uh, if you get there and you become one of the victims, then uh, you cause two problems. One, you, you take away from the capacity because you, when you came in, you were part of the capacity to respond to the incident. But two, you create more victims. So in, in essence, you create a problem for the responding team. So you have to make sure you only go to places that have been cleared and safe for you to go to. And normally, if there is a, a, a hazardous material spill or, or uh, an airborne infectious agent has been released, uh, this information will be communicated to you by these specialist teams. Uh, and they may ask you to wear certain types of PPE, uh, and, and you must adhere to this. So don't, don't put on PPE and say, no, this is too heavy, 
or I can't breathe in it. If, if you feel that you cannot adhere to what they're telling you before you go to uh, ground zero, then you should probably tell them that I cannot do this uh, so that they don't have to push you to go in there. I, I've, I've had the privilege of, of wearing some of these uh, hazmat suits mm -hmm. and I can tell you they're not, they're not comfortable. Yeah. Uh, uh, we wore it for a drill and then we, uh, we, we, we carried the patient on a stretcher for about uh, a 10 meter run. By the time we got to where we were getting to, I was sweating, I was not breathing and I actually had to put my finger in there just to pull the, uh, the hazardous material mask away so that I could draw breath because it's very difficult. It's like you're breathing through something that is offering so much resistance to you taking in air. So it's quite uncomfortable. But then there are teams who train in these kinds of uh, 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 PPE frequently and they're a bit more uh, conversant. If you find that you're not able to be able to do this, uh, other than uh, risk your, uh, yourself, you'd rather be on the peripheries, on the areas where uh, wearing those hazmat suits uh, uh, is not a requirement. So remember that uh, when you are at scenes where there have been explosions, uh, there will be a couple of things. Always expect that there might be a secondary explosion. There might be unexploded ordinances that might go off when you respond. Uh, and of course, sometimes if, if the acts of terrorism, uh, these people have also done some studying of human behavior, they know will, will create interest by having maybe a small explosion, a bunch of people will respond or will come to find out what's going on and then the second one will go off and will uh, we'll have more casualties. So um, you have to be very careful about uh, those things there. And then the other thing is, of course, if, it's a, if it was in a building or there was a structure there, uh, this structure can, of course, its integrity will be compromised and uh, it might collapse. So you have to be uh, you have to be careful about things like this. And then, of course, we've talked about things like uh, uh, airborne uh, airborne uh, contaminants. Uh, you might also have uh, contaminated patients, and these are for both the people responding on the scene, but as well as uh, in hospital, because they may not the decontamination procedure in the field may not have been completed, and you have to complete the decontamination within the hospital. So you have to be careful that. Even if you're in hospital, if there is a potentially hazardous material and these patients are, are contaminated, then we have to go through uh, decontamination procedures. And these involve, of course, taking off clothes, washing the patients down, uh, and things like that, which we may not go into detail today. The other thing, obviously, is that uh, among the victims, if it's, for example, an act of terrorism, uh, especially uh, suicide bombing among the victims, you might also have the people who perpetrated that. Uh, these particular incidents, so you uh, and they, they 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 could still be potentially dangerous. So as a responder, you also have to be uh, very mindful of that. Uh, and then, of course, there are things that can complicate triage in these scenarios because obviously, if there's a blast, um, the 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 people who uh, it it will most likely be a, a multi casualty scenario number one. But even those casualties, most of them will be multiply injured. Uh, so, so you're expecting to get a patient, it's not that they'll have injuries in one body system, they will probably have injuries in a, a number of uh, body systems. Uh, Major Dr. Tim alluded to, uh, to the mechanisms, we, we, we talked about uh, 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 there is a primary mechanism which is usually from the overpressurized air, uh, so you have the sort of a, 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 the blast, the overpressurized air which can cause uh, blunt trauma to, uh, to, to patients and normally the organs that are most involved here would be uh, uh, hollow organs, or organs in your body that contain air in them. So these would be things like uh, the middle ear, these would be things like the lungs, as well as uh, the GIT. So these would be the most likely organs that are involved. But then you can also have things like uh, the eyeball involved. And then you have, uh, you have uh, secondary, uh, secondary mechanisms, and these are usually due to uh, debris and shrapnel that is carried as part of the blast. So uh, uh, things like IEDs, for example, people will make an IED, but they might add some nails there, they might add some glass there. So basically things that will increase the, the, the extent of the injuries that the, the victims will have. So uh, these things that are carried by that pressurized air then would be what, we, what will cause uh, secondary injury. However, if, uh, if an explosion went off inside the building, and, uh, and uh, there were shattered windows or, or pieces of concrete were flying, then those, those form missiles that will also cause uh, uh, secondary injury. And then we have, uh, we have tertiary injury. This is usually from this 
uh, the pressure of the blast lifting the victim and maybe slamming them in a place and these will normally be uh, acceleration deceleration injuries and then uh, the fourth one uh, is is quaternary and quaternary is anything else that is not primary it's not secondary it's not tertiary so this would be for example if there was a blast in, in, uh, if there was a blast incident and then a fire broke out and people get burns from that fire if uh, there is a chemical spill and there is uh, there is contamination and chemical injuries or radiation or if someone got complications uh, because of uh, underlying illnesses they, that they might have this uh, forms quaternary injury and then some people of course and this is a bit academic they will classify they will have a fifth classification which are the injuries that develop when the patient is in hospital and, and they are recuperating and they might get complications uh, from there so um we uh, so when it comes to assessment obviously we've talked about this before at previous echo sessions where we use the a b c d e assessment and, and uh, uh, maybe the small thing i'll add to this is that uh, as you assess them, this is where knowing about the different mechanisms of injury becomes helpful because if I'm in the A, then I'm thinking, okay, fine, uh, what potential complications in the A am I going to find that are because of the primary mechanism? Or what injuries will I find that are because of the secondary uh, mechanism? And that helps you just work through most things. And obviously, one of the uh, important things to understand is that um, Sometimes, uh, initially, you might underestimate the extent of injuries that these patients have because some of them uh, get worse or, or evolve as uh, time passes. So you might, uh, you might under triage patients, but also there's a risk of over triage because imagine if there's an incident like this, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about the 2007 bombings at, uh, at uh, Chadondo, I was in Mulaga at the time, but then uh, after the initial blast, the people who come to hospital, most of them will have minor survival injuries. But these are the people who will have the capacity either to get private means or be able to shout for help and then be brought to the hospital. So as, as the people who are not in the field and you are in the hospital, expect that the first people that trickle into the hospital will not be the sickest patients that you expect to see. Most of them will, be, will have survival injuries. And you need to be careful not to uh, invest and exhaust all your resources taking care of those people because when you do that uh, then you will realize a couple of hours later now the ambulances will begin to bring in sicker people uh, that will require more resources we have to be careful and uh, usually in most of these scenarios that have been properly documented world over up to 75 percent of the patients who come to hospital most of them have survivable minor injuries and the 20% obviously those come to hospital last because they, they can neither walk to hospital or some of them may not be in position to shout for help. So you have to, as, as a hospital, you have to know that the people I'm going to receive initially will be the ones who are not the sickest. And therefore you plan your surge capacity to be able to handle the very sick ones whom you should always anticipate um, are going to be coming in. So we've talked about the ABCDE assessment where you look out for injuries, but the couple of, uh, uh, injuries that uh, deserve a special mention. So one of them is uh, blast lung injury, which is normally from uh, the, the overpressurized air and usually it's, it's blunt force trauma uh, mixed with acceleration as well as deceleration uh, injuries. And, and, the, and the pathophysiology is, uh, is similar to uh, a patient having lung contusions. So uh, uh, patients like this, of course, when you assess them, when you see them initially, they might be normal, or they might just be anxious. But then, as you, as the minutes and hours go by, then the patients become uh, more and more dyspneic, hypoxic. Uh, but if you get into the field and you recognize a patient like this, obviously you want to give them high flow oxygen by an rebreather mask. And uh, in hospitals, obviously, then it might also require using. Uh, positive pressure ventilation either invasively uh, or non-invasively but also taking care to make sure that you don't uh, you don't cause barrel trauma because you already have uh, compromised lungs uh, the other important set of injuries of, of course crash injuries uh, and, and as well as compartment syndrome so if if if, uh, if the uh, if there was debris that fell on the patient and they are trapped at the scene it is important to recognize that obviously if someone has a crash injury, it depends first of all how, how sick they will be. One will depend on the care you give them, but also number two, how long they've been trapped. 
Uh, so crush injury is what, what will happen is that patients will have uh, extensive rhabdomyolysis. And uh, once you relieve this, uh, once you relieve this uh, object that was putting pressure on these particular uh, limbs of the patient, then you will sort of restore blood supply and blood flow to these particular areas. But there will be a lot of devitalized tissue, dead cells, and these will release their toxic contents into the bloodstream. And when these are carried to other uh, areas of the body, then they cause injury. And uh, this, this might, uh, these patients will present with a sort of deteriorating organ function. So you might have a patient initially who was trapped under a, a, a collapsed uh, building block. They come to hospital, then before you know it, they develop difficulty in breathing. Before you know it, they are not making urine and they have acute kidney injury. And this is from uh, uh, reperfusion. So in the field, one, it is important to recognize patients who uh, uh, have crash injuries. Uh, and usually the recommendation is that you must start some form of management in the field. Uh, usually it's getting a large bowel IV access, uh, starting some IV fluids before you, uh, you do the extrication. Uh, sometimes if, if you're not able to start the IV fluid therapy, there is, a, there is an argument for uh, uh, applying a tourniquet to the, to the affected limb, uh, freeing the limb and then taking them to the hospital. And of course in hospital, if you get a patient like this who has a tourniquet, then you need to start, uh, uh, you need to start giving them uh, large volumes of fluids before you release the tourniquet. And the idea here is that you want to create diuresis so that you uh, protect the kidneys. So in addition to the fluids, obviously, sometimes they will, they will, will, will also give uh, alkalinizing drugs, also will give, uh, will give uh, uh, diuretics. So the recommendation is normally you give them about uh, 20 mils per kilo of fluid as a bolus, and then you give them maintenance fluid, which is usually about a liter to one and a half liters, and I'm talking about adults, a liter to one and a half liters per hour. And your target is that you want to see that this patient makes about 300 to 500 mils of urine. Uh, per hour. And if you're giving them this amount of fluid and they're not reaching your target uh, diuresis, then you can add uh, diuretics. You can use acetazolamide, uh, and acetazolamide serves two functions. One, it's a diuretic. Two, it also alkalinizes urine. And the other one is you can use manitol as well for the, uh, for the same purpose. And, and of course, when you, when, when you do this, we, we ex because we talked about the breakdown products of, uh, of, uh, of uh, rhabdomyolysis, but also things like myoglobin. And the reason you're alkalinizing is you're essentially trying to uh, limit uh, the, the, the degree of toxicity that the kidneys will suffer as, as a result of all these uh, uh, breakdown materials that have been released into the system. So the other forms of management uh, for the different kinds of injuries will really, they don't differ so much from, uh, from how you would manage other injuries, but you have to always be aware that these patients are potentially multiple injured and you have to uh, approach them as such. So if they have a fractured limb but you think that uh, they also have some degree of crash type injury, then you might have to be very careful how you splint them uh, because you know that splinting is also increases the risk of you developing a, 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 a compartment syndrome. And uh, uh, of course once you get them into hospital it's important to determine uh, if you're in the field, it is to determine what injuries does my patient have, where do I need to take them? Which hospital will be able to provide them the care that they need? Because there is no point in you getting 40, 40 victims and rushing all of them to the casualty of Mulago Hospital. Because one, you, unless they tell you that they have the capacity to handle these 40 patients, you will be probably causing more harm than good, because then you will cause a mass casualty incident in the hospital. Yet there are other hospitals where you can sort of divert. There are hospitals like Naburu, there are PNFPs. So you might be able to divert some of these patients uh, to these other facilities, depending on the capacities of those facilities. So uh, I want to reiterate the point that uh, the major raised that it's important that in these situations, uh, communication is paramount, that all uh, standby facilities tell us their capabilities, and the kinds of patients that they're able to take care of so that the ambulance teams then are dispatched by the incident commander to go to places where these patients will get, uh, will get the care that they need. Uh, with that, um, uh, I think I'll, uh, I'll stop there, but I'll, my parting shot will be on uh, 
Uh, decontamination, because I want to reiterate, you must always make sure that your patients are decontaminated because you we, uh, PPE is limited. So the quicker you decontaminate your patients, the easier it is for different uh, clinical teams to be able to take care of them. But number two, there's a, uh, and I'm, I'm referencing the case that Dr. Ilok had presented, is that there's a very good role for uh, social toilet. You don't have to, you may not have the capacity to debride the patient where you receive them, okay? But you definitely, definitely have the capacity to do social toilet. So if you have a facility that has running water, and it, the tap water is good enough. Uh, uh, running tap water with, uh, with with soap and you have and you have these soft brushes you can do extensive social toilet with copious amounts of water and you'll have potentially saved their life because if you have someone with a, an injury that has cow dung it has dust it has mud extensive social toilet will be able to get rid of most of that uh, debris and when they go to a place that has surgical capability then the, the surgical teams then will be able to say, okay, fine, this is dead, devitalized tissue, then we're going to cut it away. But if you, if you see a patient like this, and all you do is just dress their wounds and sit on them or and refer them, then you have not contributed to the chain of care. So you must, as much as you can, do extensive social toilet as, as best as you can before uh, you refer them to uh, other, other areas of, of care. Obviously, it's a bit different if a patient is actively hemorrhaging and you may not have the capacity to take care of them, but do the best you can in the situation where, where, in which you are. And I say this because I, I see a lot of patients who come, they've had head injuries, either dig loving injuries, and they come, some uh, facilities have seen them, uh, they, they, they've given them TT granted, they have, they have done some cleaning, and they, they, some of them have even gone through the, through the trouble of suturing them. But when they come in sutured and then you open up the wounds, you find that inside the wounds there are stones, there is dust, I, I, we found grass, we found cow dung inside there. Uh, and then you see that you, there was a problem in there and you just closed down the problem. <laughs> right? So sometimes it's just, it's just helpful that you wash out that area, pack it, dress it, and then make the referral. And you will have saved uh, a patient's life. And with that, I'll end there. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Abugonza Kenneth. And um, I, I think some of your points about uh, the fact that the walking wounded will probably be the predominant group uh, of patients from a mass casualty incident, and that you don't always have to rush to treat them. You can oftentimes treat them in alternate sites. I uh, remember as a phys uh, as emergency physician, a bus accident, um, and most of the people were fine. Um, and we just put them over in the cafeteria, yes. and I went and took care of them in the cafeteria because I wanted to save our uh, emergency beds for people who were true emergencies. So you have to be creative uh, in the hospital setting with those patients. I think additionally, um, the point that you uh, made about the categorization of blast injuries, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary, so there's a lot of kind of consequences downstream related to a blast injury. First one, so the primary injuries where the uh, which really affects those organs that are um, filled with air because of the pressure waves, and then all of the secondary trauma, whether it be from the falling buildings or being thrown um, uh, uh, from a blast, or whether it just be uh, the impact itself. So it's important to understand this, um, that blast injuries are very complex. And so at this point, uh, before we go into our practical uh, portion of the session, I want to open it up to people uh, on the Zoom call for questions for Dr. either Dr. Odu, uh, uh, David, or Dr. Boganza Kenneth uh, about their presentations. And please raise your hand and then we can call in. I'm going to start with one question. I know that. Uh, Dr. Pagansa men, uh, mentioned um, rhabdomyolysis and trying to preserve the kidneys um, from a crush injury. Uh, maybe Dr. Odom can discuss a little bit about uh, compartment syndromes. Is that something that you might very well see with somebody who's been trapped right under the debris for hours and hours and hours, especially in a low flow state? Uh, it's something we have to be able to recognize quickly uh, and to treat quickly. So maybe Dr. Uh, yeah. David can comment on that. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chan. Um, as you are well aware, as we discussed earlier on, the crush injuries 
you have the building on the just collapsed or any debris has collapsed on the on our victim. First of all, before we we release or we remove the object from uh, the individual, first things first, tourniquet. Tourniquet is important because if you lift off that heavy object, suddenly there will be a rush of blood to the injured limb and you set up a cascade of events that will be um, primary or secondary to the injury, which may end up resulting into our, our compartment syndrome. So first step is we put the tourniquet. One, we're preventing the bleeding because we don't want the, the, the victim to bleed out. Two, we're also pre preventing other injuries that may occur as a result of uh, the release of the Depression. The compartment syndrome now we are looking when we go to reach the hospital. We should anticipate that. The hospital, what is your plan on that? So now the surgeon having uh, or the team, the, the, the multidisciplinary team that is within the hospital there, should have looked at or did they determine this patient is at risk or not risk. These are usually now the or what I would call the secondary or the third level. Um, level of complication you are going to get. But the most important thing, as we are releasing the patient from that point, to prevent it, let us first of all have tourniquets. Thank you. So here's a, a question from the chat, which is, I think we've talked a little bit about this, is how do we prevent um, AKI impression use? So maybe Dr. Garaza can uh, take that question. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so. Uh, we we spent some time talking about uh, um, uh, primary injuries that happen and how we prevent them, because the idea is that you're trying to save lives. Uh, but then you also need to know that the people who die immediately after the blast, there are those who will die if they don't have any intervention, and then there are those who will die a few days later. And obviously, the ones who die a few days later sometimes are very very painful because you're like, well, we put so much uh, resources in saving them and now they die. And uh, normally, uh, things like acute kidney injury is what will kill some of these patients. So the, the, the data is that most patients who have crash injuries, about 40% uh, about of them will get AKI within the first six hours without, if you, without, if you don't intervene. And at 12 hours, 100% of them, that means everyone with a crash type injury will have acute kidney injury. So and that's, that, that, that for me just uh, sort of points out why it is important for you to be able to recognize what are the risk factors for, for a patient developing acute kidney injury. So one of them is if, if a patient has been trapped under debris for a long period of time, so either a limb has been trapped or the whole patient is trapped. But number two, which is less spoken about, is if someone has been lying in a particular position, even if nothing is lying on top of them, if they've been unconscious, and maybe there were a, a building collapsed, but not fall on them, but they are unconscious and maybe it takes us several hours to be able to retrieve them and they've been lying flat on the ground. And they will also have uh, uh, an element of rhabdomyolysis, which is essentially muscle breakdown. And when you have patients like this, then you need to anticipate because uh, AKI in these patients don't wait to diagnose it because when you do diagnose it, then you're a bit late. You need to be able to anticipate that this patient who's been li lying on the ground for this prolonged period of time is at risk of AKI. This patient who had a trapped limb is at risk of developing AKI. So you start, you start your fluids, you make sure that there, that there is diuresis. You can even obtain, uh, if you have investigative capacity, you can obtain some baseline labs of the renal function, things like CKM, because then those guide uh, your volume resuscitation uh, uh, plans. But also, if then they go on and develop AKI, even with appropriate interventions, or you, or we dropped the ball and we're not able to give them appropriate interventions and they developed AKI, then we must have, we must know how to treat the AKI. But number two, we must also have the capacity to uh, provide the dialysis services. So if you have patients like this, then you, uh, part of their management, you should be planning on moving them to areas that have uh, a capacity to be able to provide them with dialysis. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bukonsa. Any, um, any other questions out there? Uh, please um, raise your hand or put them in the chat.
So there's a question from um, uh, uh, one of the participants. Um, is, are there any special considerations to CPR at the scene of a blast injury? So uh, uh, either one of you want to start off with that? I, I can start. Um, are there are special considerations to CPR. So now, two things. Um, when, you're, when you're going to initiate CPR, is uh, what are the benefits of CPR versus uh, what capacity do I have? Now, uh, CPR is a very good uh, uh, medical intervention, um, but it must be, like most medical interventions, it must be the right patient at the right time and in the right place. So imagine a bomb blast has gone off uh, in a building that had maybe 1,000 people, and you potentially have 1,000 casualties. And you find someone who's unconscious and responsive and they have no pulse. Uh, but this is one of very many people. Are you going to commit uh, three to five health workers or three to five responders to initiate CPR? Uh, probably not, because then that will not be the best use of your resources. Because a lot of times we talk about uh, preventing cardiac arrest is much better than you managing the cardiac arrest. You have, you have better chances of success. So don't, uh, again, uh, 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 beware of the tunnel vision that, okay, I have this patient who has no pulse, I need to start CPR. Uh, in, 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 if they're the only patient that you have, then, then it's, it's, it's a fair enough intervention. However, if you have a number of other patients to work on, those are patients in the field that if you're triaging, you'll put a black tag on them, meaning that they're not salvageable. So you don't even uh, invest your resources in uh, taking care of them. Uh, now, the, the story might become different when you are in the hospital setting because if, if I'm in the hospital setting and, and I have enough resources to handle the patients I've received from uh, the mass casualty incident, if one of them has a cardiac arrest during care, then we can discuss, do we have the resources to take care of this person? And if you have them in the hospital, then absolutely initiate CPR. But out in the field with several other casualties uh, in the area, but also an area that is not appropriately secured would not be a very wise uh, use of your resources. Yeah. Thank you very much. Dr. Joe, do you have anything to add? Yes, um, I do concur with, uh, with Dr. Bagonza. Um, basically, it is a situation of total chaos. Lots of noise, um, you have limited resources, you have no time, and you're needed everywhere. So you do your best effort. The ones who are you feel you cannot do much, you proceed. So you're trying to save the ones you can save in the limited time you have. And remember, you're not going to be in there, that area, for more than, if you're very lucky, you'd have maybe like around uh, two hours at most before you can get to the reef. So whoever you can pick and salvage, you send backwards. You're going to move. So CPR. In a hospital setting, yes. Out in the field, if it's, as I said, if it's one person, probably it will make sense. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Oda. And I, I would just remind people that um, that even in the best of hands, uh, somebody who uh, doing CPR on a patient with blood trauma is probably less than 1% survival rate. So you really have very, very low odds, um, and you have to obviously expend a lot of energy. It's different if it's penetrating trauma. It's potentially different if you have somebody who has a cardiac cardiac disease and an underlying heart problems. But from a blood trauma, I think it's really um, uh, almost a futile uh, exercise. I have one other question for uh, probably Dr. Baganza, and that is, um, can you elaborate on the first aid management of fourth degree and fifth degree blast injury? Okay, so fourth degree and fifth degree blast injuries. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what they mean by fourth and fifth degree blast injuries. I don't know, maybe uh, uh, if you're talking about mechanisms, uh, because me mechanism. I don't know, because if it's mechanisms, then the fourth one yeah. would probably be quaternary. And quaternary, really, we're looking yeah, at. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, so these are patients who have burns or they have inhaled smoke and they have carbon monoxide poisoning. Or, or, or the, the bomb blast went off and they were so scared and uh, 
and they had uh, they, they had an event where maybe they had a simple event and passed out. Now those are the ones that we call quaternary. That they are not they are not primary, they are not secondary, they are not tertiary. So obviously, if, if you have a patient who has burns, the management will be the same like you would manage other burns patients. Uh, of course, there might be a small difference because they could just be plain thermal burns, but then they can also be uh, chemical burns. Because if it's chemical burns, then you also have to uh, add the element of decontamination uh, to part of their management. However, it will be preventing heat loss, preventing uh, uh, secondary contamination of those, of those wounds, uh, fluid resuscitation, pain management, as well as referral to an appropriate burn center. But if you have a patient, for example, with 40% or 50% burns, then there's no point, you don't have, don't take them to, don't take them to Mulago, main Mulago, because you know the burns unit is in Chirudu and they have the capacity to handle burns patients. In the field, it is getting IV access, because if you have a patient who has burns, IV access becomes increasingly more difficult the more time passes after they've had a burn because they're getting edema tars, uh, they're getting fluid depleted. So you who responds to them and sees them first, you must uh, prioritize getting IV access after having done the rest of your assessment, initiate fluid resuscitation, and then um, uh, prevent secondary uh, contamination. If, if it was a chemical burn, then decontaminate them with the appropriate uh, uh, the substances, and then you make, you make appropriate referral. Part of your first aid is making sure that you uh, you make sure that they go to the right place for uh, definitive care. Yeah, Great. Well, that answers the question. Thank you. Do we have any other? Uh, oh, uh, Dr. Mary Ellen Lyon has a question. Go ahead. Uh, well, it was more of a comment, uh, if I may. Uh, I was uh, just coming back to the question of the CPR. Because um, it's something that we struggle with uh, really every day, even in the Malago Emergency Department. And I just wanted to say to remember that the point of CPR, of cardiopulmonary resuscitation, is to buy time to do something to reverse the problem. So the classic case is someone who's having a heart attack, who's having, you know, an ischemic cardiac event, and you're pressing on the heart and forcing it to pump to give some blood to the heart and the brain to buy time, hopefully to bring the heart back until you can get to a cath lab and, and remove the obstruction, right? It's why like in penetrating trauma, it might be worth it because you may be able to close the wound and get resuscitation. So the reason that there is so little return on CPR usually in blunt injury is that you are unlikely to be able to reverse the reason that the person, the, the, the reason that the heart stopped, right? If you're right next to a surgeon and you can pour a lot of blood in in a mass transfusion and get them straight into surgery for an x lap possibly. But that's why it's very rare. So I think whether it's in the field or in your healthcare center three or, or in the National Referral Hospital, the question always is, why did this person arrest and what can we do to fix that problem? Because otherwise you're just pumping on the heart, the heart isn't going to come back if you can't reverse the problem to begin with. That's all. Great, thank, thank you so much for that comment. And I think I would just remind people that when you're talking about mass MCI triage uh, and by all the different um, schemes, that the first thing you do on somebody who isn't breathing and doesn't have a pulse, uh, isn't breathing is just do a chin lift or a jaw crush. Because that's, if that's the cause, of their arrest, then you can reverse that with an airway. Um, but if not, then um, as uh, Dr. Mary Ellen said, uh, it, it's likely futile. So um, I do want to thank everybody for their questions. I think at this point, um, and our uh, experts for their answers, and I think at this point we can move to um, uh, our practical demonstration of management of fractures in the pre-hospital and emergency department by uh, Mr. Kaban. Uh, Goza Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> many times when you are handling uh, casualties due to blast, many times we do things wrong. Sometimes we kill our patients. We kill our casualties. Uh, I have this gentleman. Let me give him Tom. He's called Tom. He has this. 
the survival spine is very, very important. Sometimes when you reach, you know, you have many casualties, everyone is screaming at the scene, and then everyone is carrying, you know, casualties, uh, you know, the way they want. But uh, you have to remember that when you have many casualties, some of them have C-spine injury. So any cervical collar you have, be it uh, you know, a rigid one or a soft one can serve a purpose. So sometimes we really do killer casualties. Obviously. Because of our own with the numbers, if are screaming, the other one is crying because of maybe you know a wound on the finger, and then you're overwhelmed. But you have to secure the spine very well before you transport the carrier to any place. And another thing you have to mind about the transport. That one is very, very important. That's why I wanted to start with it. So in pre-hospital care, many times you don't have a lot of time. You don't have a lot of time, and many times if at all somebody has an open fracture, or maybe uh, two or three open fractures, of course with the blast, it will not give you the real picture in the book that somebody has to get only one fracture. Somebody will have fracture of the humerus, tibia, femur, even the pelvis. But all individual fractures, they have the average amount of blood they bleed. With the fracture femur, the average will be around two liters. In the pelvis, around two and a half, three liters. And in the, in the other individual uh, fractures, it will be less. So when it comes to pre-hospital care, many times you have to improvise. You have to improvise because you may not have you know, everything you want. Another thing you have to control the bleeding if at all there is an open fracture. Of course, you do what you can to control the bleeding. Uh, assuming Tom has a fracture tibia, I have splints. I'm lucky that I have splints. Though they are different uh, you know, sizes, and they have this one, which can be molded to what you want. Uh, Dr. Tim, please. I uh, have Dr. Tim, and the, we have come to rescue this person. Of course, he handles. Okay. Assuming we have a fracture tibia which is open. Of course, I have to give him gloves. And another thing, remember, you have to work very fast. Because there's another screaming there, cannot breathe. OK. You may not so much mind about the, the shoe, yeah? And then uh, get a bandage. And I think use what you have. Bleeding tibia, maybe with shaft. I have my cotton. Because this cotton will be like a foreign body in our, in our wound, I put it in a. This is pre hospital. This is what you have, eh? Okay. I secure this with a uh, bandage. Many times you don't have to be very smart. Or <laughs> somebody's bleeding. Okay. Um So this is what you have. Another thing you can secure the split. Okay. Well, with the figure of eight and the ample, very fast. Okay. 
You said two are the splints, very well. Uh -huh. This is very good. Our fracture tibia, which was open, is immobilized. Many times in the situation where you, have, you see the dressing is soiled, you don't have to take it off. You just add. You just add more cotton, more gauze, whatever thing you have, and then you secure it with a, another bandage. Okay. This is where we are. Do it very well with another bandage. Our maintenance, when we are at the scene, you make such mistakes. The dressing is soiled and you feel like you know you have to take it off and then you put another one, you put a new a, a new one which is really, really very, very wrong. So, assuming this is a fracture tibia, it's ready for to uh, be transported because the splint has immobilized. And many times you have to remember always that many times you use what is available to secure maybe fractures when it comes to the pre-hospital pre care. And remember the uh, principle of immobilization. You have always to immobilize the joint below, the fracture site, and the joint above. But if you don't have anything, you have to use what is available. That one is really very, very important. What if somebody has a fracture femur? Uh, Dr. Ilopet talked about the Thomas Flint. Some of them, uh, some of people have been at you know, hospital level, you have the Thomas Flint. But when you're in the field, you have to use what is available. Many times you have seen us use these uh, cardboards, OK? We align them very well, we secure with the strapping and then, you know, I raise like this and then we put the beam. Another thing to mention, uh, this is pure hospital care. No one will blame you, you are saving a life, you are saving a limb. You are saving a limb and you have to do what you can to save a limb. Of course, some of these pins are of different sizes, you may have this. A splint also. I uh, may have this type. Uh, it's a splint also. But see, in the situation where you don't have any splint like this, of course, as uh, what we have been discussing tonight, right. teams come up and then they help at the scene. So we find that a team from uh, St. John's Ambulance, they have come, they have those splints. We find that you have nothing. For example, where media do, media doctor or team works. You have sticks around, you know, you in the bush down there, somebody has gotten a, you know, a gunshot. This is what you have to do. You have to improvise with the sticks and then you immobilize with what you have. Another thing to mention, I know many of you have not seen, seen this. Uh, this is a pelvic binder. It serves a lot when it comes to the fractures in the pelvis. But uh, of course, we are here to, uh, to demonstrate this, but this will not happen in the field. Out there, when you're there, you use what? Uh, a sheet. Use a sheet, and then you pass it there, and then you mobilize the pelvis very well. Because we have said that the pelvis is around 2.5 liters, or 3 liters. Of course, these injuries, which bleed a lot, will kill the patient. And many times uh, you don't care, but uh, as a bystander or as a first aid, you have to come in and then to check on the patient. The patient will tell you, or will you see the real injuries? If it is open, you will anticipate that it's a pelvic injury, which is open. So this is a pelvic binder, but there may be very few out there, and I know some of us maybe have not seen it anywhere. Okay. Turn the patient. Somebody pushes it. 
are then done from the patient lipo. Will you pause it? Maybe you could tell them what the landmarks are about where you're putting that because sometimes it's mm -hmm. mm -hmm. too high. Mm -hmm. Okay. Around the axis, yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, the, the lesser trochanter. Yes, those are the landmarks. Uh -huh. And then you secure it. Like so. yeah. It's the right size for this patient. And many times we find that the patient is obese and you have to improvise because this one may not fit. So, this is really very important for hospital care. It's really very, very important to use what is available, what you have uh, for this. And uh, this casualty is transported uh, to, the, to the hospital. What happens at accident emergency? That's hospital level. Uh, you find that uh, many times we concentrate on the individual injuries we see other than uh, treating a patient as a whole. It's always very important to save the life, okay, before saving the limb. Other some of us concentrate so much with the limb in uh, accident emergency. After working on the limb, you realize that the, the patient is not breathing. So always focus on saving life first, and then you go ahead to save the limb. Otherwise, uh, the bystanders will never forgive you if at all you concentrate on the, on, the, on the limb and the patient is gasping. That one is really very important, and as uh, all the presenters have said, it's always must, uh, multidisciplinary. Dr. Lockett talked about lab work. It's very, very important. Putting a, a line is very important. We always work together in the team. Of course, that team can be comprised of emergency physicians, orthopedic surgeons, uh, the lab technicians, the allies, and then uh, the neurosurgeons. Uh, mention it, okay? Uh, many times when these patients reach the hospital, that's when we look at the definitive management of the patient. Uh, this term, we put this next patient that he has a C-spine injury. So that's when you do uh, cervical, you know, spine x-rays. Pull out the C-spine. Always, you have to do it. Because this C-spine injury or fracture will kill the patient. If at all, you miss it. It's really very important. And then you go ahead and make other investigations, as we know. Uh, Many times, what actually what I left out is that, as what the presenters have said, always call for help. Otherwise, you can also become a casualty in the event that you are giving, you know, the first aid management or you are giving the pre-hospital care. You can come, uh, you can become a casualty at any time. They see you, you know, painting. Okay, that one is really very important to call for help. Um, of course, this is it for today. But what you have to remember always is that uh, you manage the patient as a whole. You don't concentrate so much in the bleeding side. Here yeah, the patient is struggling to breathe. You know, the patient is not breathing. You know, you concentrate so much uh, with the injury which is visible. Another thing to mention, there is an argument whereby can compartment syndrome occur in open fractures? Members have to think about that and we have the answer. Can compartment syndrome occur in open fractures? Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. So I want to just uh, maybe ask you to talk about if you didn't have this, right, which probably nobody does in the field, how would you, put, how would you use a sheet? Okay. I wish you had a sheet here. Many times, uh, of course, we talked about a sheet, if at all, maybe have it, but sometimes... Okay, just pretend this is a sheet. Mm -hmm.
So normally this would be wider than it yeah. would be wider like a sheet folded over yes. four or five times. Yes. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, okay, so some people say you can you can log roll them, right? Mm -hmm. Do a formal log roll and then you then slip the sheet under them. But for the purposes of this demonstration, we'll just slip it under them. Okay, this is our sheet. Then uh, do okay, be a little longer. Then you can actually take a can, take a stick yeah. and twirl it around yeah. to tighten it up like a tourniquet. You do this, yeah. Right, and then you secure it. And what this does is is most of the major bleeding comes from the posterior pelvis, yeah. and this closes it up. Yeah. Um, and is actually truly a life-saving thing uh, you could do in the field. I think there's also a couple other comments about cervical collars, understanding that most people, most ambulances won't have this collar. Um, and there were a couple of comments made. One of them is uh, improvise, as you said. Yeah. Uh, one of the common improvisation is using a sheet, same kind of thing. You roll up the sides of the sheet, put it under their neck, put an IV bag or water bottle on each side, inside the sheet, and then put a piece of tape across the forehead, a tape across around, around their neck. And that's one of the ways you kind of mobilize them. Another way is something called a blanket roll, doing the same thing, but you can, because a blanket is thicker, you can just roll up the edges on either side of the neck and then put a tape across the forehead and probably across, across the, the neck itself. And then finally, maybe um, Dr. Kenneth can talk a little about what you've done at MUS with the collars, because I think that's pretty innovative. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Ari. Uh, we, unfortunately, we did carry one of them here, but uh, we have, uh, uh, as a uh, uh, hospital, we've uh, improvised, because then again, you always have to work with what is available to you and within your means. So we, we, we have improvised from a commercial collar, a cardboard collar made of uh, normal saline boxes. Uh, and this is uh, uh, specially cut and stapled together uh, with uh, these big commercial staples to be able to uh, uh, mimic and provide the same cervical spine support as a commercial collar would. And, uh, and uh, we've, done, we've done some studies on it that have found that uh, Actually, uh, for the first six hours, it provides pretty much the same support that uh, uh, a commercial cervical collar would. And its only downside is actually it gets wetter, of course, if the patient is bleeding, when they're sweating, when they're secretions, it gets wet and then becomes soft and is no longer effective. But it gives you enough time to be able to protect that C-spine, get the patient to imaging, rule out C-spine injury, and then you can take it off. Or if you confirm that they truly have C-spine injury, then in this moment, maybe patients have mobilized funds and then they bought a commercial collar, which then you swap out the cardboard collar and uh, improve the commercial collar. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's something that I think is, uh, is uh, uh, worthwhile thinking about, especially if you're in places where you, uh, access to commercial collars is limited. Great, and I can speak. I can speak from personal experience that it does the mobilizer very well, um, <laughs> um, um, having put one on. But it's a little more uncomfortable than the than the foam collar, right? definitely. But it works in terms of mobilizing the spine. Um, so thank you very much, Johnson. That was very helpful. Uh, helpful practical demonstration. Yeah. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Bagosa could uh, share the diagram so people could. I know it's yes, yeah, so, so maybe you could uh, share the kind of the yeah. template, yeah. template yeah. picture yeah. of the collar. Absolutely. And so people can make them. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah. 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 All right. And so we will send that out to the group here. I mean, we'll put it on the website. So I think at this point, we have a, a few minutes left. Um, three minutes, three or four minutes left. If there are any general comments from the panel experts, any uh, people who want to raise their hands uh, uh, in terms of questions or comments in the last few minutes we have to fill. Okay. 
think a uh, quick one from, uh, from my side. Uh, one of the issues we feel and forget are the psychological issues um, following uh, uh, blast injuries. So expect um, anger, feeling of uh, frustration, helplessness, and also the desire to revenge. So all these events that will affect the, the mental health of uh, the victims, so we're looking at those who are directly involved and those who are indirectly involved. So, so we need to look at that as also as a part of the square that goes on. And also we need to think about the special groups, which we see the Pokotini, and the pregnant uh, ladies, um, children, uh, the elderly, uh, persons with disability. We also want to get persons with we have language barriers. I'm sure most of you have tried to manage uh, patients and you can't communicate. So it, it brings a um, challenge to your management and uh, possibly the outcome of your efforts. Thank you very much. So Dr. Lerner, thank you very much. That's a very important point. We spend a lot of time talking about saving lives and saving limbs. Um, uh, and when we are successful, we have to think about um, what its effects are on people after, afterwards. Okay. Uh, there, um, there was one, let's see, uh, Timothy, um, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question or comment? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Am I audible? Yes. Okay, I have uh, two areas. Uh, first, uh, this goes on crash injuries. Uh, it has been highlighted and mentioned that uh, before you excrecate a patient, you need to take this into consideration. Uh, most people may take that word lightly, but it has a lot of implications. It means you have to start your interventions before you pull the patient out of the uh, this thing, the rubble, whatever uh, object is compressing the limb. Before you take it off, you have to set an IV fluid in, start running the IV fluids at a very fast rate, and then maybe apply a toniquet proximally, and then take this patient. Why is it so? Other than abdomyolysis, which will happen, and then the effects of AKI will happen uh, a few hours later. When you release this patient, you're going to now open up, like uh, Dr. Tim said, reperfusion injury. You've had a distally anaerobic respiration happening with a lot of uh, anaerobic metabolites and then uh, radicals and then toxic elements released. Some of these include potassium, okay? So once you release an entrapped limb, you release all these all of a sudden into circulation. Actually, this patient will have a cardiac arrest. And what is going to kill this patient there and then is the hyperkalemia. And you will never get out of a hyperkalemic arrest, resuscitation. So what are we saying? Before you release that entrapment, place your tourniquet, put a too large bow IV cannula, and then you give fluid. The fluid, your target is going to have a urine output of 2 ml per kg, okay, per hour. Now, once you've done that, you can execute a patient, take them to hospital. In hospital, you'll bring them to ICU, probably to me, a man anesthesiologist intensivist. So we will start now the rhabdomyolysis what? protocol, which means we need to hydrate the patient. We'll do an ABG, look at the, the, the pH of the patient, acid bed balance of the patient. We will institute things like sodium bicarb in the fluid that we're giving to alkalinize the urine. To make sure we this dumping then uh, uh, worsening the um, uh, renal function. Then uh, I don't know, maybe someone may comment on the role of uh, manitol in scavenging some of these radicals. Some people also add manitol uh, to this, but uh, it is timely uh, resuscitation as you're looking at end results, monitoring urine out almost every hour, monitoring your potassium, monitoring your sodium and then looking at all these other things. So that is the importance. The other question um, I think was on whether you're going to take a lot of time in the field trying to do full resuscitation. If you've done pre-hospital trauma life support, like our colleague has been stressing, 
you only have two minutes to educate a patient and make sure they are en route where they're going to get definitive treatment. Now, before you do this, you'll do what you call a scene size up. When you come to the scene, you look, what has caused this scene? Is it safe for me to go? Is there any other exposure like CBRN that I may not be uh, aware of in the air? Is it safe for me to? And then you triage them. The ones that you're taking to hospital are the ones that are going to benefit. If a patient needs CPR on scene, most likely they will not. And in blast incidences, you have a mass casualty situation. So triage is very important. Know that if a patient has had an arrest, it is hypovolemic, it is hemorrhagic arrest, they definitely need blood. No amount of resuscitation or fluid is going to help and you don't have blood there. Now uh, about the fractures we have seen, I wanted the doctors to elaborate, especially the emergency physician, uh, on how you would manage non-compressible um, catastrophic uh, hemorrhage. For example, in blast injuries, what would you do? I can come in later. Uh, Thank you. So, thank you very much for those uh, uh, very insightful comments. I think there may have been a question for Dr. Pagans in there in yeah. terms of managing non compressible hemorrhagic shock. shock. Non compressible hemorrhagic shock. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a discussion on, it, on its own, but I will attempt just to mention a few pointers. Obviously, Non-compressible means that uh, uh, it is it is not over the extremities. Either it's within the chest, or uh, or it's within the abdomen. And since uh, uh, Doctor Major Doctor Tim talked about uh, the special groups uh, for babies, uh, even intracranial hemorrhage can be catastrophic because uh, they have a smaller blood volume. But talking about adults, they lose huge blood volumes in the pelvis in the abdomen and in the chest. Those are the ones which are major in uncompressible. The ones that they lose in the long bone, those a bit of pressure as well as, to, as applying a tonic will, will be able to uh, uh, provide you adequate uh, hemorrhage control. So usually um, one is that if, if a patient has, uh, if you bleed in the chest, either it is from uh, uh, injury to the lung parenchyma, and normally here, uh, they, they will have, they might have, depending on the degree of the injury, they might have some significant uh, uh, intrapleural hemorrhage where they'll have a hemothorax. And commonly here, before they even bleed out, mostly they'll have respiratory compromise. And uh, sometimes uh, putting a chest tube in the field uh, might, might be able to address uh, part of the issues as you start a fluid resuscitation. And of course, we said preferably blood, but that may not be available uh, in the pre-hospital setting. Now, if they continue to bleed, their, 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 uh, their guidelines on what volumes uh, are an indicator for you to go for a thoracotomy, meaning that you have to go open the chest surgically and achieve hemorrhage control. But if it is one of the major vessels that are running within the mediastinum in the chest, and it has been severed as a result of uh, one of the mechanisms of uh, the blast, then I do not think uh, any form of intervention in the field will be able to save this patient. Because first of all, you will hemorrhage out so quickly that getting to you in the field and getting you to hospital to get you specialized uh, vascular surgery care will not be uh, so logistically possible. So patients like those, those are the ones that will most likely die. By the time you respond, they will be dead already, or they will be on the way to death, and there's not much that you can do. And if it's, if it, if it's in the abdomen, then what we normally recommend, and uh, it has limitations in the field, is, is uh, sort of, uh, of uh, a hypotensive resuscitation or permissive hypotension. That a patient is hypotensive because they're bleeding into the abdomen, but when you're resuscitating them with either fluids or blood products, your, your aim is not to restore full perfusion because then that will, uh, will just uh, facilitate ongoing hemorrhage. So what you do is you perfuse them just well enough to maintain uh, uh, perfusion to vital organs like the brain until they can go to a uh, theatre and, uh, and achieve hemorrhage control. And once they achieve hemorrhage control, so if, if they open up the abdomen and they see that there's an obvious bleed and maybe it's a ruptured spleen, and someone clamps the, the splenic bed, then you begin full resuscitation to be able to uh, uh, fully restore the hemodynamic status. Now, 
That normally uh, hypotensive resuscitation or permissive hypotension is done in conjunction with uh, a bigger field which we call uh, uh, damage control surgery or damage control uh, resuscitation. And, and uh, I've been in situations where some of these have actually been done in the ED. That you, you, the theater is full, they're trying to clear the theater for you, but someone is crashing. And they will open the abdomen clamp, and then you will fully resuscitate, and then they will take them to theater, and then complete the rest of the, uh, of the procedure. The chest is, uh, is, is, is a bit different, unless normally it's, 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 the, it's the lungs, and they can do something about it. But if it's the major vessels, most of those patients, uh, unfortunately, will die before they get, they get the care that they need. So, so thank you so much. I think we're running out of time. I believe that the post test is up for members of the audience to take the post test. And I'd like to really invite the panel of experts to give some closing remarks uh, uh, in terms of what they, some of the take homes that they would like for our audience about last injuries and uh, fracture management. So I'll start with Dr. Odom David. Yes. Um, thank you very much, uh, the panelists and uh, our audience uh, online. Uh, basically, the tips I want to give to the first responder, those of us who will be going first there, uh, promotion of safety, your safety first, and your safety first. Um, second is you need to be calm, because that situation is volatile, so you need to be very calm so that you can give your best. Uh, promote correctness, do the correct thing, the correct time, the correct way that you can save life. You also need to promote self efficacy. Do what you know and how you do it best. Second, and sorry, uh, last but not least, is promote hope, both to your casualty and to those who are around you. Uh, as I always say, and somebody has told me that uh, do not run around like a headless chicken. Because it will panic. So you have to you have to promote hope. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Kamagosa Johnson. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I start with uh, what Dr. Tim has said. Give hope, even if there's no hope. Always. That one is very important. You see somebody is bleeding and then you say, for me, I'm just trying, but you see, you are dying. Somebody will die. But many times, if you take on the situation and they say, you know, you are doing well, I'm managing this, you will be fine. Okay? Even if there is no hope, but those people, you have seen them survive. Um, what you have to always remember is that uh, still, uh, it needs continuous reassurance to the patient, or to the casualties you handle, them, and then to the you know, those people have come to help, okay? Continuous reassurance. And uh, always save life first before you save the limb. Otherwise, you can't apply anything to the limb when somebody, you know, uh, is dead. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Dr. Abaganza Kenneth. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Harry. Uh, my take home three, number one is, uh, please uh, provide pain medication. Make sure that your patients are comfortable, even if they're dying. Uh, we all want to die as painlessly as possible. But even those who are not dying, manage their pain. Uh, and make sure that they are adequately paid for Afghan allow. Number two is uh, learn to communicate. Um, if uh, learn to escalate things, if you, if if uh, you have been overwhelmed as a facility or as a as a responder, but be succinct in your communication. Uh, talk about uh, what kind of help you, you you need, where you need it, and how you need it, so that uh, the appropriate resources can be uh, availed to you as quickly as possible. Uh, when you receive these patients in the hospital, please remember to decontaminate them. Those that have uh, uh, chemical exposures, decontaminate them, but also the ones who have uh, debris and different contaminants in uh, the different uh, uh, peripheral wounds that they might have, please decontaminate them. Uh, water and soap is good enough. It has to be running water, so not water in a basin. It has to be tap water or uh, you have a pipe. 
um, and you must wash them with as much water as you can to make sure that you get those wounds as clean as possible because you will have done uh, 90 percent of the work and then lastly remember that these are multiple injured patients so uh, don't uh, fall into the trap of having uh, a tunnel vision uh, think about what other potential injuries the patients might have and make sure that you have uh, uh, you can get the teams that need to respond uh, to be present as, as as much as is possible within your setting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, so thank you. Uh, uh, I want to thank our panel members. I hope that our audience has uh, really gotten some information today that they can use wherever they are uh, in the system because we're all part of a team, a team that takes care of patients who might be uh, might suffer from a blast injury or a fracture. Uh, you could save a life with a cervical collar, whether it be a, a one that bought in a store or one devised from a, a sheet in an IV bag. You could save a life with a uh, uh, with a pelvic binder uh, made out of sheet uh, and a stick from the side of the road. So uh, use some of these things you've learned. Uh, use yourself uh, and take care of yourself and take care of one another. Thank you. Uh, we have the polls running, so we are requesting you to answer the polls. The question, the answers to the polls are going to be provided as soon as we have enough responses. And then lastly, we shall uh, take our screenshots. And if you want to access the screenshots, please check on the website. Also, the video is going to be uploaded to the YouTube channel. So we request you to uh, access the YouTube channel and uh, get access to the video recording. But in the meantime, let us respond to the polls. And then we shall go ahead and take our screenshots. And anyone with comments, last minute comments, please you can post them on the chat. We shall be happy to address them in this last minute. Uh, our last set of uh, questions for the polls, uh, they are general assessment polls, so we request you to click on how you felt the session went, and then you click submit at the end. We want to know if the objectives were met, we want to know if Dr. Harry was a good moderator, or if uh, Dr. Bangons have given you the right information, so uh, click on the rating of your choice. You know, I would say it's like they say to me when I get out of an Uber, be sure to give me five stars. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as Dr. Harry is campaigning for a higher uh, <laughs> uh, let us switch on our videos so we can take screenshots. And these screenshots, like I was saying, they can be found on our website. If you want to access our website, just go to your uh, search uh, engine and type in uh, EMS Echo Uganda, and the website is going to come. The same thing on YouTube. The video is there, and all these PowerPoint presentations are uploaded there. Can we get more ratings as we uh, turn on our videos? Uh, anyone with a comment as we end, you can uh, raise your hand if you have any internationals. We appreciate recognizing you uh, for your participation in these sessions and uh, we request you to disseminate what you've learned. Doing a session is. Uh, no. Doing a session is. Uh, Yes, uh, Rosaria, I'm saying you have a comment or your hand is up. International, I'm from Angola. 
Uh, we are happy to see Rosaria from Angola. Uh, any other international that we have? Ghana, Ghana, Susana, Susana from Ghana. Uh, people from Ghana, we normally have people from Somalia, Nigeria, okay. Sudan, Kenya. We are happy to see you. I hope our videos are ready. Hello, I'm called Nasra Fundikira and I'm from Kenya, but I study here in Uganda. I just wanted to say thank you very much for these sessions. There's so many things that I might not have had the chance to cover in my junior rotation, but I got the chance to have an introduction to them in these rotations and I'm appreciative of your efforts. Thank you. People are talking of BPM, they were failing for us in that decision. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that warm comment. Any other international comment? I'm seeing uh, Miriam, you want to say something? Yeah, hello. I'm Miriam Ousia Diodu from Ghana, and I want to commend the team for the hard work that they've done for us. I'm also an emergency nurse and I've learned a lot from it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Team Ghana. We appreciate it. Uh, okay, so our screenshots are being taken. Excuse me. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much to these presenters. Uh, special greetings to Dr. Kabogoza over there. He has mentored many. However, my concern is, can you hear the contacts of the presenters for social capital? Because we have always learned from these eco sessions, but the presenters never share their contacts yet. <laughs> 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 Thank, uh, you. Thank, thank you for raising that. Uh, so we are going to ask the presenters, they are here. Uh, I hope they give a public consent, so I don't want to be the one to bring bad news to you. <laughs> and you're seeing them on camera. Fortunately, I'm not on camera, so uh, they are there. So we shall ask them to share their contacts. Uh, any other last minute comment? Uh, we appreciate the residents who have attended, and also the students. We appreciate your uh, participation. Thank you. My name is Dr. Rich. Uh, my concern is about uh, cervical collar. Possibly we need to use Nexus criteria to rule out cervical injuries. Otherwise, we are going to put cervical collar in all the patients. You need to rule out normal level of alertness, midline tenderness, and that person is not intoxicated. So you're definitely going to rule out that person and that person will not need cervical color. Thank you.